Good morning, Calvary. Good morning. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Dan. Good to see you. <laughs> um, we are so happy that you're joining us this morning. Um, we're going to have a little bit of worship. We're going to have Jeff bring his message um, wherever you're at, your living room, if you're still laying in bed. Could be. Could be. <laughs> On the couch, in the PJs. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, if you're wearing be... a coat and tie, you're overachieving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, right. So it's, it's, um, we're glad you're here. Welcome. Uh, it might be raining. It might not be. Forecast says it's going to be raining. Um, but we're so glad you're here. Um, what do we got in the news for you? Yeah, I just want to hit you with a couple announcements, and then we're going to get into worship and the Word. Uh, youth group, we had a great time Wednesday night with the Zoom.us app, and we were, the whole youth group was there online, and we were playing games, and Dan led some worship, and we had a Bible study of the Word. So that's going to happen every Wednesday night, 7 p.m., Zoom.us, and we're communicating through all the channels we have available. So youth group, stay in tune for that. It's, it's, it was awesome. Right. So um, speaking of communication, we're going to be making sure that you check your emails. We're shooting out some emails, keeping you updated. Have that Facebook page, Calvary Lompoc. Be sure to like so that you can keep getting our information. Youth Facebook page, Lifehouse Calvary. The Instagram, at Calvary Lifehouse. It's all on your screen right now. Should be. Hopefully. <laughs> and uh, the kids, Children's Ministry at CBC. And, of course, our website, calvarylompoke.org. And you can call into the office. You want to talk to Alice. Wish her a happy day. She'll wish you a happy day, and it'll be great. If uh, you want to worship the Lord with your tithes and your offerings this morning to continue to support the work of the church, um, and you want to do that on the church website, calvarylompoke.org, you'll find a link at the middle of the page that says Donate, and that's a place where, where you can give. You can give to the Benevolent Fund, which will redistribute out to other people. And then just have your eyes open for your neighbors and friends and loved ones that have needs and, and love them tangibly that way. So um, as you give unto the Lord, those are some ideas and opportunities that you have to, to give that way. Right. So um, anyway, we're just super glad that you guys are here. Um, it's going to be a great time of worshiping this morning. I encourage you to sing your hearts out, make a joyful noise to the Lord, and just rejoice in that. Um, and pay attention to the word. God's going to move. God's, God's word is living and active, and technology does not suppress that. It's going to be a great morning. Glad you're worshiping with us. Um, let's worship. Um, glad you're joining us this morning. Uh, listen to these words from Psalm 23 uh, before we sing these words. Um, Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, let's sing.
Amen. Amen. Um, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much that uh, we're able to uh, use these um, uh, technologies to uh, still be together even when we're apart. I pray that Jeff brings your word today in this message well and that those who are watching and listening are staying healthy. Uh, I pray that you protect, uh, protect them and protect, uh, protect your people. Um, and I pray that our hearts are prepared for uh, your word today. In all these things, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Or maybe it's the afternoon if you're delaying watching this uh, video. Uh, we are so grateful for the opportunity to use technology. So you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube. Maybe you've gone to the website. Very grateful for Emily and for Daniel, our young people who are helping us put this together. And so today we are going to be in a passage from Matthew, uh, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. I'm Pastor Jeff Harrington, the intentional interim here at Calvary Baptist. I've named this sermon uh, something a little unusual. It's when Jesus didn't act like Jesus. And so as we get ready to read this text and learn from it, it's pretty difficult to understand if we don't know the cultural settings. We have to remember the audience in this story is Middle Eastern. So all the cultural norms of the day are in play, and they are hearing the words spoken through those cultural norms. If we don't understand this, this story can be embarrassing, and we will try to explain things away that don't need to be explained away. But it doesn't appear that Jesus is acting like Jesus when we first read this story. Before we read the text, let me set the scene that we're about to enter. There are three characters in this story. We have Jesus, we have the woman, the mother, and we have the three disciples. We need to keep all three in mind as we proceed through this text. None of the three are ever excluded from this dialogue. Also keep in mind that Jesus is always in teaching mode and his disciples are his chief concern. After all, although they don't know it yet, they are going to be the ones who proclaim the gospel to the world after his death. They will need to be like him. They need to think like him. They need to develop a heart like Jesus. And this episode, this situation is going to be a strong teaching for them. What they learned is what we are about to learn here today. So let me start off with the first two verses. The scripture says to us, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering horribly. Jesus had arrived in a Gentile area, a non-Jewish area, to continue his work. This is really highly unusual and actually pretty controversial for a Jewish teacher to do. He was opening, him up, opening himself up to situations where he'll have conversations with people that he shouldn't be having conversations with. That's exactly what takes place in these two, these two verses. Jesus is about to do some very un-Jesus things. But let's look, let's look at what happens. A woman, a mother, is described as a Canaanite woman. Not a Gentile, which would have been bad enough and accurate, but a Canaanite, an enemy of the people of Israel. This is, this is bad. But she's also a woman. In the Jewish religious culture at that time, they did not regard women highly at all. Possibly they would regard a, high, a woman highly if she was of noble character and, and married, but not in this case. A religious leader, a rabbi, did not talk to women. In fact, they actively avoided women in the public arena. The fact this woman came to Jesus at all is remarkable and speaks to Jesus' good reputation. It's also a hint to a faith which is really unexpected. This woman addresses Jesus in a profound way with the term Lord. Now, that wasn't unusual, and it could be interpreted in the same way we might say sir or ma'am to somebody today, but she accompanies it with the phrase son of David. She is actually speaking a rarely used messianic title, conveying a reverence we might miss without this understanding. She is addressing Jesus from a belief of who he actually is. Her plea before Jesus is heart-rendering for any mother to hear cried out. 
Notice she doesn't directly request healing for her daughter, but cries out, have mercy on me. This woman is in pain over her daughter's suffering. There's no way for Jesus to miss this or to overlook the reverence she is showing him. Now, at this point, it's good for us to pay some attention in the situation we're even in right now. You know, in America, in our clo- being enclosed, wondering what's going on, why is this happening, that we have to understand when it feels like God is silent, there's probably a lesson to learn. And for this woman, and for the disciples around, and even those listening off in the distance, that silence that Jesus just imposed is going to be a teaching tool. But he does respond a little bit later. And that response is more than troublesome. Again, it sounds very unjesus like Jesus did not answer with a word, so his disciples came to him, urged him, send her away, for she cries, keeps crying out after us. See, Jesus is seemingly ignoring her cry for help. This is a very public event. Everybody would notice this. Again, remember the third character of the story is the disciples. They're right there. They're observing everything Jesus does. There are times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see the disciples readily respond to Jesus' teachings. Other times, they are confused and have to answer questions, ask questions, excuse me, get answers later. A few times, and this is one of them, they think they understand what Jesus is doing, and they respond according to their cultural biases. They think, because this this woman shouldn't be bothering Jesus at any level anyway, they take Jesus' initial silence as an implied support to their thinking. But Jesus is is actually about to take this woman through a tough test of faith to ingrain a teaching to her disciples. He's about to lay bare their bigotry and ethnocentric worldview. But again, first, he seemingly reinforces his statement to send her away, unappeased. And again, as we think about this and how do we apply it today, we have to understand that when it feels God is silent, we will need to persevere. The answers don't readily come sometimes. We have to keep praying. In fact, we're told, seek, knock, continue the prayer until we do hear. And in situations that we're in now in America, this is going to come to play come to bear very often. So Jesus gives an answer. Now he speaks. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now the disciples are going to be taught right now. He doesn't directly confront their negative stereotypes. In fact, he appears to to be supporting their lack of compassion, their judgmentalism, even their nationalism. The Middle Eastern scholar Kenneth Bailey writes this about, in a way, how the disciples might be thinking. And so he wrote, I will start by shutting her out, and hopefully she will leave on her own accord. A self-respecting rabbi like me would not talk to a woman, particularly a Gentile woman. If I do talk to her, all of us could be thrown out of the district by an angry mob. If she persists, I'll make clear to her that my healing ministry is only for Israel, She will then have no choice but to leave. The disciples, not drawing upon their knowledge of Scripture and forgetting the story of Elijah, which took place in the very same region when he took care of a widow who had no income for her children, her child. They're certainly not remembering Jesus' ministry up to this point where he was showing great compassion to all people. They think they understand what Jesus is saying. They think he's saying, of course I want to get rid of her. I don't have time for this low-life Gentile. And again, a lesson for us. When the, the disciples were missing at the point, they would get better later on in ministry for sure. When we don't know or we forget what Scripture teaches us, we're going to make some poor decisions. And we're in a circumstance in our country where we need to make good decisions, where we take care of all those around us. Those we don't know even, we need to be caring for them, checking on our neighbors, following up with phone calls, whatever necessary to make sure people are all right. That's what scripture would tell us to do. 
Now it's interesting because the disciples think they get the hint. So would the woman get the hint that Jesus had no time for her? After all, he's kind of there to rest. He's not there to minister to non-Jews. But as we'll now read, she doesn't understand Jesus' words the way the disciples thought they were understanding them. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. No, she doesn't take the hint. She humbles herself. She lowers herself physically as a way of reverence to who Jesus is. She gets on those knees and she has an even deeper plea from her heart. She shouts her plea with less formality. There was no way that anyone in the audience, the disciples and particularly Jesus, could miss this heart-rendering cry for help. Yet, strangely, Jesus continues to be seemingly on Jesus. He replies, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Whoa. Did Jesus just call this woman a dog? That can't be right. That would be very on Jesus. Some of our commentaries today try to water down this interaction. But folks, I just got to tell you, there's no watering this statement down. It sounds exactly what it sounds like. The only animal more unclean to a Jew than a dog was a pig. They were not the pets that we think about. They were wandering, scavenging animals. These are terribly unkind words in any discourse, but particularly to a kneeling woman pleading for the healing of her suffering daughter. The shocking sounds of these words, though, were exactly the way the disciples were thinking. He was actually voicing the narrow-mindedness of his disciples. And folks, it's a terrible thing when the sin we think we can keep hidden is brought out into the open. This is exactly what Jesus has done in order for his disciples to understand their wrong thinking. It can be acutely embarrassing to hear your prejudices verbalized. Even worse, played out before your eyes. He invokes this equating of a non-Jew as a dog to tell them he knows their bigotry. He knows their thought process. At the very same time, he's given this woman another opportunity to express her faith at an even deeper level. Don't forget, the woman is hearing these words in a public setting. But Jesus is using this word dog in a way that actually might have a tinge of gentleness to it. The word being used actually says means little dog. and In fact, he's lessening it. Now, it's not clear if the woman picks up on this subtle expression or not, quite frankly. We don't know that. But listen to how she presses back on Jesus' response. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. It would not be out of the realm of possibility for this that this woman would have responded with some kind of vindictive statement or flee in utter humility and tears flowing. We would probably even empathize, sympathize with that kind of reaction. We might even defend that kind of reaction after what had happened. Yet what we see is we see a woman respond to a perceived insult with an acceptance of the analogy and then turns it back toward Jesus on why her plea should be heard. Her love for her child and her belief that Jesus is who she thinks he is, Lord of all, causes her to stand before the crowd in an incredibly courageous and genuine faith. Folks, I just need to say the object lesson of her faith. No matter the difficulty of the situation, trusting in the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ will keep us being persistent and persevering in traumatic times. Just like this woman did. She's rewarded in her unfailing confidence of Jesus as the agent of God's salvation to all Jews and Gentiles. Her public humiliation is worth the price 
of Jesus' mercy. Just like Jesus' humiliation going to the cross so we could receive mercy took place. We get to read this in the concluding verse where he declares her faith as something we all should seek after. Then Jesus said to her, woman. Now, that is not a derogatory statement in this culture. In fact, it's an elevating statement. He's actually addressing her personhood. He is lifting her up and says, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Remember, the daughter wasn't there. She's at a distance. The woman's opening request, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me, followed by her cry of, Lord, help me, which was met, first of all, by silence from Jesus, is now addressed and granted publicly for us to read about today. The disciples would have to recognize the depth by which they must love all people groups that Jesus did come for all people, that he wants to reach all people and bring them to him. And so I address you today, if you're listening to this and you don't know the Jesus I'm talking about, and he's probably very un-Jesus in the way you're thinking because Jesus is Lord of all, but Jesus came for you, just like he came for this woman. He went into an area that he wasn't supposed to go, actually to search people out. That's what he came and did when he came and lived on this earth. He came to dwell among us so that we could be brought to him, so we could be established in a right relationship with the God of creation. But it requires a decision on our part. And and the question that always has to be there is, have you made a decision to trust Jesus as this woman did? Can you overcome yourself and go to Jesus and say, I know who you are, and I come and present myself to you? See, there's great promises in Scripture. You know John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world and he gave his own, one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That means life today with Christ and life after you die with Christ. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. See, Jesus knew he couldn't overcome ourselves. Our sins, we can't fix them by a, any amount of good deeds. A sin is a sin. It stays what it is. And and it says all of us have sinned and fall short of the standard of God. We all fall short of it. Every single person. That includes this woman. Includes those disciples. And the wages of that sin, in other words, the consequence of that sin is death. And it's a death in which we live this life without purpose, without dignity, without understanding our inherent dignity because we're made in the image of God. That also means eternal separation. It means how? because we refuse the love of God. But he also says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then this great statement comes. It says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. While I was doing drugs, while I was being violent, while I was in my divorces, while I was robbing and and stealing things, Christ died for me. Whatever sin you have in your life, whatever mistakes you're harboring and feeling guilty of, Christ came, went to the cross, knowing those were going to take place. They did not catch him off guard. He willingly died so you could have forgiveness for those wrongdoings in your life. Willingly did it out of his love for you. So how do you get saved? There's no hoops to jump through. There's no rituals to perform. It's as simple as this. That if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, that means that he should be in charge because he created you. He should be in charge of your life. And believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. For if, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. That means made right. So if you say Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart he was raised from the dead, what it says is you are now made right and can enter the presence of God. And it's with your mouth that you profess and are saved. And so I come to you today to ask and plead in a sense that you would do this. You would start a new life. And in a little bit, I'll, I'll say a prayer. And the, the words of my prayer will not, they're inconsequential in that sense. But if they address the issues of your heart, which is what God's reading, then he says you're going to be saved. And what I would encourage you to do post that then 
is if you're in somebody's house who already knows Christ, is talk to them about this. Say, yeah, I, I've made this step. What do I do next? If you're listening to this by yourself, you've never been to a church, we ask you to contact Calvary Baptist here in Lompoc, either on the website or through a telephone call to the office, and we'll help you in your next steps as we continue this journey together. Christ made us to be together. So let me pray a prayer, and I pray that these are the words of your heart. Lord God Almighty, I am a sinner. I need your help. I need you to be in charge of my life. I thank you that you'll forgive me for all my sins. In fact, you have forgiven me for all my sins now, and I need it, and I accept it. And I want to live a life that brings you honor. I want to live a life that's different than what I've been living. I'm going to need help. I need help from other Christians to do this, and I commit to doing that. So, Father, I thank you. I know you hear my words based on the promise that I just heard today. That if I confess with my mouth, you are Lord, and believe in my heart Jesus was raised from the dead, I will be saved. Thank you for that gift of eternal life, Father. May I live according to it. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So again, I encourage you, if this is the start for you, get hold of people you know are believers. When that time comes and we get to regather, we're going to look forward to regathering with you. But we would like to know. We want to know what God's doing in the world. And you could share that story and you can be an encouragement to other people. So I'll close this with a benediction that I use every Sunday morning. I pray it's a blessing to you as you continue through this day into the week. May the Father of heaven, the almighty creator, who created you in his image, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for the forgiveness of your sins, and the Holy Spirit, who is God, who will indwell, come and take up residency in you if you follow Jesus, transform you into his likeness, empower you to live a life that brings honor to God. May he be evident in everything that you do, everything that you think, and everything that you say. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in, and we will be back next week doing the same thing. Goodbye.